I will tell you, I was terribly excited to get the sermon title for this morning up, primarily because it references a song, many of you may know, Too Legit to Quit by, who's going to say it? Oh, come on, please. MC Hammer, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I referenced Too Legit to Quit and then in parentheses put on because, hey, that actually captures the message uh, for the morning here. Uh, What we're going to be looking at as I prayed is the fatherly love of God and how he demonstrates that, how he displays that, how he works that out in our discipline. Okay, uh, and this morning we're, I'm hoping to clarify some things about what discipline looks like because we all have these different ideas. Maybe you grew up with a harsh disciplinarian for a father, for a mother. Maybe you grew up with a non-disciplinarian. Maybe you grew up thinking that discipline was the worst thing that could happen to you. Maybe you grew up thinking that discipline was the most rigorous thing in the entire world and you had to follow certain standards, certain rules a certain way or you would be beat up by whomever was in authority over you. And this morning... As we look at discipline, there is something that I want you to take away, really two things that I want you to take away regarding God and regarding yourself. And the first is this, that if you experience discipline as a professing Christian, that is one of the best signs that you have the favor of God on on you. If you experience discipline as a professing Christian, far from being a sign of God's displeasure with you, it is actually one of the most significant marks that God is pleased with you. Okay, and we'll see this morning how it says you're being treated as a son. And by the way, we're going to hear the word sons a lot this morning. I don't want you to miss that if you're a woman. I don't want you to feel like you're excluded in that. This is simply phraseology that's used to give us an example between father and son. So please, ladies, do not uh, feel as though you're being diminished here in your role. This is focusing on a relationship between a father and a son. As we look at the father, God the Father, and the son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're seeing that played out. So as we think about what it is to be adopted as sons, we're thinking about the relationship between Jesus and the father. So ladies, please don't misunderstand what we're communicating when we talk about being a son this morning. You were included in that just the same. So for you, if you're experiencing discipline as a professing Christian, it is a profoundly good sign for you. And furthermore, when it comes to understanding the character of God, if God were to not exercise discipline of his people, he would be unloving toward us. And both of these truths that we need to understand are completely contrary to what we are wired naturally in our sin and our selfishness to believe because if you were anything like me, the first thought that when when something bad happens to you, when something bad happens to you, you think the first thing is what did I do wrong? Did I do something to deserve this? And you know what, sometimes we do, but if you're a Christian, there's this subtle hint that comes across in how we think, and it's typically, well, I did something that upset God and I have to do something to fix it now. When we encounter bad situations, we encounter things we don't like, this is what wells up in our hearts, and then we think, maybe God doesn't love me as much as he loves so-and-so. I look at this circumstance and I look at my circumstance and I think so-and-so is a professing Christian and I'll confess I've had these thoughts many times. I've had these conversations with my wife many times where I'll, I'll think about something like I see that Christian over there and it seems like everything's going well for them and I'm experiencing fill in the blank and you think maybe God just doesn't love me as much as he loves them. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we've had these thoughts, we've had these conversations, we've had these talks with God himself at times, I hope, in prayers. You think, God, I'm really struggling with these feelings, with these thoughts right now, and I need you to clarify some things for me because I'm really questioning, I'm really doubting how deeply you love me. This is a common experience that we have. And so this morning, as we look at Hebrews 12 continuing on, we're going to look at how the author of this letter is writing to people writing to this church that is filled with people who are on the verge of experiencing some significant hardship. Some people had already experienced some of it, but they're on the verge as a whole of experiencing difficulties and hardships that they did not want to experience, and they're thinking, I don't know if this is worth it, and furthermore, I don't know if this is really even a sign that God loves me because I'm seeing these other people around me. I'm seeing, I'm seeing these, these buddies of mine who committed apostasy, 
an apostasy, being falling away from Jesus. These friends of theirs who said, you know what, start out as a Christian, going back to Judaism, it looks like a better option. I won't be persecuted. I see these buddies of mine and they're, they're having a good time. They're not being persecuted. They're not experiencing hardship the way that I am being persecuted. And the temptation is to pull away and to shrink back and we'll see how it's not a good idea. Furthermore, if somebody is in a position where it's a professing Christian, they just kind of wander off, they don't experience any discipline, that is a terribly, terribly awful sign. So too legit to quit on. You'll see what that means in a second here. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. Here's that word, endure again. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father's spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So here's our big idea for the morning. Here is what I want you to think about, snapshot, whatever you want. A necessary mark. A necessary mark, and these are all very intentional words, a necessary mark of a genuine believer is a faith that is tested by the intentional and fatherly love of God that employs circumstances and sufferings to protect us from ourselves and make us like himself. A necessary mark. By that I mean if you are not experiencing this, and you've been a Christian for any length of time, if you are not experiencing what seems like frustrating purposes in the hands of God, where you want to do something, you seem like, I can't do this. I keep trying so hard to do this, and it seems like God won't let me, and I see the people around me able to do this freely, and I'm not experiencing this. What is wrong? I will tell you that a necessary mark of a Christian is that type of experience. There's a, there's a, a song, the title is, uh, Oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go. If you're a Christian, God's love is demonstrated to you, among other things, in that he will not let you go your own way. And again, if you're speaking with a professing Christian, they say everything's fine, and you know that they're just living, doing whatever they want. It's not fine, because a necessary mark, as we'll see, of sonship, the necessary mark of a son, a daughter, a child of God, is that you're experiencing God's constraining work. A necessary mark of a genuine faith, because that's what we're concerned about, genuine faith, faith that endures, faith that's tested. And I will tell you again, as we've looked at for the past number of weeks, couple of months now, as you look at the lives of believers who have gone before, you see tested, 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 tested over and over and over again. And it was not because of a lack of love on God's part for them. When you look at Abraham, you see a man that says he's, this is the friend of God. Can we doubt that Abraham was loved by God? No, you can't doubt that. And yet it says explicitly that he was tested that God put him in circumstances where his love, his trust in God would be tested and he would be shown to be genuine or false in that situation. That is the fatherly love of God. God is caring for his child, Abraham, by testing him. True love has boundaries to it. True love has constraints to it. You will not look at somebody you love and let them do whatever they want if you know that it will harm them. And God's love for us is demonstrated in that type of care. So, no surprises. Hebrews 12, 5 through 6, I'll read this for you here. 
Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Here's where we're going with this passage, these two verses. In the shuffle of daily life, it's easy to lose sight of clear truths that we don't want to be true like this one. The true Christian will never be ultimately left to himself, to his own desires, without the intervention of God. So, why do I bring that up here? Why, why do I say this? It's because the author of this letter is saying the same thing to these people. He says these words, he opens this up in verse five. He says, have you forgotten the exhortation? He's saying, you knew this, you know this, you knew this, you know this. Have you forgotten this? Have you forgotten this exhortation? An exhortation is simply a strongly worded encouragement, a strongly worded call to action and saying, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten this? Clearly, these people would have known it and they would have not have only known it because uh, the, the author of the letter would have communicated in some capacity with them to this point, but they would have known it because this word of exhortation he's re- referring to here is a direct quotation from the Old Testament. These people with a Jewish background should have been well aware of the fact that what they were experiencing as a follower of Christ, as one who was fulfilling the Old Testament law and as they are pushing into him and trusting in him, it should not have been a surprise to them that those who are genuine believers compared to the false believers that had populated Israel and Judah for hundreds and hundreds of years prior, it should not have been a surprise to them they were experiencing hardship. It's all over the Old Testament. They should have been aware. They should have known God has revealed this to his people for thousands of years that he cares for them this way. Here's the direct quotation we just saw, Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. It says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. This is Proverbs chapter 3. And if you're familiar with Proverbs chapter 3, it's really setting the tone for the entire rest of the book of Proverbs. You know, you get the often quoted 5 through 6, do not lean on your understanding, etc., etc. This is setting the tone for what the entire book of Proverbs is going to communicate. And amongst other things that sets the tone, sets the table for the book, is for people to understand the words you're going to hear may be hard words. And the entire book of Proverbs is really written from the perspective of a father to a son, constantly reflecting to them, son, I love you, I care about you, here are some things you need to know if you want to live a life that honors God. You need to understand these things. This is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What does it look like to fear God? What does it look like to live a life pleasing to God? This book is going to communicate this to you and understand that your identity as my son is what's driving me to communicate this to you. And he says, Don't be weary of God's reproof because just like I, son, just like I delight in you and therefore I am communicating to you these things that you need to know to live and succeed in this world in honoring God, so God is communicating these things to you. God reproves those whom he loves. Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 6. These are, these are remarkably beautiful words. I love going through and seeing, especially in Deuteronomy, so much of the gospel kind of foreshadowed and so much of the, um, the, the, the truth of grace just laid out clearly for people. It's a wonder that they didn't see it. But in Deuteronomy, we have these words. God is speaking to the people, and he says this. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So this is the same experience that we saw in Abraham's life and Noah's life and the lives of all these other saints, these great cloud of witnesses that are being spoken of in Hebrews chapter 11. And so over and over you have their lives demonstrating the same thing the people of Israel experienced, which was God led them in the wilderness that he might humble them, that he might test them. What's really there? What's really in your heart? Who's going to show themselves to be genuine? And it goes on to say this, and he humbled you and that you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. 
you see here how God has kept the people. It says, your, your shoes didn't wear out, guys. You spent 40 years wandering around in a desert. That would have been occasion to consume anybody, but you weren't. God fed you. He gave you things that sustained you. He didn't give you everything you wanted. He gave you what you needed. And the reason he did this is because there are two things at work here, guys. You needed to be tested and you needed to be cared for. And the two always go together. God was not about to just drop into the laps of the people everything they ever wanted because they would turn into people who were, quite frankly, worse than the Egyptians, I am sure. When you were tempted to think, if God really loved me, he would give, fill in the blank of the thing that you want the most, stop and think, why would that be loving of God to give that to you? Why would that be loving of God to give that to you? What is it about that thing that you think is most loving of God to give it to you? Maybe it's true that that thing you want is something that would really be an expression of God's love, but most of the time, if we're honest with ourselves, we think, I am at this moment defining for myself what the love of God really looks like for me. And throughout the course of redemptive history, it's never been a good idea for people to do that. Instead, it's submitting to God and saying, God, you know what's best for me. I'm going to ask you for things, but however you decide to fulfill my needs, you're going to take care of, and I know it's going to be better for me than what I wanted to begin with. God is clearly communicating that to the people here of Israel in Deuteronomy. Early on in the history of redemption, early on he says these things. Amongst the first five books of the Bible, we have God saying, I love you so much, I'm not going to let you do whatever you want. I love you so much, I'm going to humble you, I'm going to test you, because that's better for you than to let you wander around and do whatever you feel like. A point here before we move forward. The distinction between discipline and punishment makes all the difference in the world when we think about God's dealings with us. We'll get to Job 5 in just a second here, but I want to be clear about something before we go any further. As we talk about discipline, as we talk about discipline, there's something helpful. I was talking with Pastor Josh and Pastor Justin this week as we were sorting through these issues about what, what does discipline look like and it's different from punishment. Okay? Because, again, it depends on the environment you grew up in. Maybe you grew up and the idea of discipline was simply punishment. You're being punished. It's just retribution. You did something wrong and you're just punished for it. And unfortunately, a lot of people experience that and they think then that when we talk about discipline that it's God just kind of looking at us and coming down with an iron fist and he disapproves of something we do and so he's just going to be angry with us. And it doesn't seem loving for us to experience that. There's a helpful verse Romans chapter 8 that, that helps us understand this. It says, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So how does that help us understand this difference between discipline and punishment? If you're concerned when you hear the word discipline, as we go throughout the rest of this message, you think, I don't know if I like the idea of being disciplined. My God, it seems harsh. It seems mean. And here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to understand. When we talk about the discipline of God, it is for believers only. And I want you guys to be crystal clear about this. An unbeliever does not experience the discipline of God. I'll, and I'll have you take that to the bank. Discipline is a loving, fatherly, caring disposition that says, I am working for your good, and if we understand what, what's the root behind the word discipline, it has teaching. A disciple is one who's taught. Discipline is fundamentally teaching someone. When you experience God's discipline, he is not punishing you. To be clear, he may use punishment as part of discipline. But think about what, what would be the best parenting you would experience. You have a child who does something really stupid. And you're like, I need to punish them for this. It's not mere punishment. If you're a good parent, you look at your child and say, I'm going to punish you, but it's part of a bigger picture. I'm not just paying you back for doing something wrong. 
if your kid does something stupid, you can say you're being punished with such and such a thing. But then you have the conversation. Why am I punishing you like this? And what do you need to learn from this? That's discipline. An unbeliever does not experience that. An unbeliever does not relate to God as a father. Okay, those who received Jesus are those who had the right to be called children of God, sons of God. And so if you have not received Jesus, you cannot relate to God as a father. Now, if somebody comes to Christ, they can look at a life and how God has dealt with them and you think, man, every step where I was kind of pushed back against, that's God disciplining me so that I might come to know him. But at the end of one's life, if somebody is not a Christian, all they've experienced when it comes to how they're dealt with in their sin is punishment. It's not intended to make them holy because they are not holy. There's a difference between how the legal system addresses somebody's sin and how a father addresses their sin. The legal system is not concerned about the changing of someone's heart. They're simply concerned with, will you be paid rightly for what you did? A parent, a father, is not concerned to do that. A parent or father says, you've broken my law, but that's not my relationship with you. My relationship with you, I'm your father. You're my child, you're my son. So I want you to learn and I want to protect you from the consequences and further actions like this. That's the difference here. And it makes all the difference in the world in how we think about it. Discipline is only for believers and it's important you understand God does not discipline us by punishing us only. God may use punishment in his process of discipline but it's always to teach us. And we'll see that as we move to the end here it is always for this great good in view. Job chapter five, we find these words. Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but his hands heal. Blessed is the one whom God reproves. These are not the words of somebody who is not blessed of God as an unbeliever. These are words about somebody who is blessed by God, chosen by God, set apart by God. Blessed is the one whom God reproves. Happy is the one. Happy is the one set apart whom God loves and treats in this way. So don't despise it. So enduring discipline in any and every circumstance, Hebrews 12, 7 through 9. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? To that point, God utilizes every tool in his workshop and every circumstance in the lives of believers to demonstrate we are his children and to make us look like what we are. So, when we think here, it says, you're being treated like a son. You're being treated like a son. When you're a parent and you look at the good, the well-being of your child, even us as sinful human beings, we look at what it is that we can do to care for our children. We think, what can I do to help them be the best that they can be? Parents save money, set aside money for their children's college fund. They pay for trips to places. They try to do fun things and have good experiences. Parents utilize all these different resources, all these different ways to communicate. They love their children. And the best parents do that with an end in view. They don't just needlessly throw things and experiences at their children. They just throw money at their kids. They don't just throw experiences or band camps at their kids. They say, I have this goal. I have this vision for my child in view. I want them to be this kind of person. So I'm going to do what I can to invest in them so they will be this type of person. And so they're being treated as a child. You don't do that towards the neighborhood kid. You don't just go down the street, knock on a door, and say, I have these things. There's a relationship that exists where you're being treated as a child when your parent treats you this way, when they utilize all these different tools, all these different experiences to help you be the kind of person that they want you to be. And so in God's hands, we think, how does God relate to me? And we take a step back and we look at the picture of God that we have in Scripture. We don't see a God who is disinterested. 
We don't see a God who just wound up a clock and let it go. We see a God who has from before the foundations of the earth ordered everything that comes to pass, everything. And if we see God is so intensely interested in how everything is being worked out, then what does that say about how he is relating to your circumstances? It means every single one of them is getting ordered by him. And then we take this other step and we look in the, around the corner and we think, okay, and it says here that God is a father who disciplines. We, we think discipline is not simply God saying you did something wrong, therefore I'm going to punish you. Discipline is I have a vision for who I want you to be. I have a vision for who I want you to be and so I'm going to tailor your experience. I'm going to tailor everything because I have all power in the entire world. All authority is mine and so because of that, I'm going to tailor your life experiences to make you the person that I want you to be and we know in scripture that what it says is that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose and that purpose is to be made like Christ. So if we know that, if we know that, we think, okay, God has this entire workshop that he is, he's pulling tools out of and he's saying, I know this needs to be done here. I know this needs to be done there. I know this needs to be done here. And I'm going to use these things to make you like my son. It's interesting when you think about the outworkings of your life. And you think about the experiences that you have and you think, why did I experience this and somebody not? And I would argue that because God loves you so personally that he knows everything that you need. It's a pretty common thing in Christian circles to look at somebody else's story and be like, oh man, their story is more exciting than mine. Or that person's story seems a whole lot more pleasant than what I grew up with. And fill in the blanks anywhere in between of the experiences that people have. And yet you think, as much as we might regret things, as much as we might think, I wish things were different, God would not have it any other way. And that's a strange thought to have. We do not like everything that happens in our lives. This week, you will not like something that happens to you. And yet, God is not out of control. God says, I know what you need. You're not gonna frustrate my plan. I know what you need, and I will make sure that you get it. Even if it means a spanking sometimes but I'm gonna make sure you're tended to. That's fatherly love and care. He uses these tools. Some, some passages out of Proverbs, again, this book is replete with this type of language. Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. It's a picture of parenting where you have this tool, this opportunity to correct. And God says here, if you don't utilize this tool of discipline, of, re, of responsive discipline, saying I'm responding to bad behavior, you, you actually hate your kid. These are strong words, but they're God's words. Whoever spares the rod hates his son. If God spares the rod with you, does it say that he loves you? Think about that. Proverbs 22, 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. God's purpose for you when he disciplines you is not to kill you. It's easy for us to think, man, this is the worst. This is the worst. And God is saying, no, it's not the worst. I'm not, I'm not doing this to beat you up. I'm not disciplining you because I am angry with you. I'm disciplining you because I love you. I'm not doing this to scare you into terror. It's, I'm doing this because I love you. I need you to know and trust my authority. Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your son for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Now, these are great parenting words. Um, don't set your heart to killing your kid. That's general good rule of thumb here. But the point is, if you're a good parent, you don't set out when you discipline your children to do harm to them. Now, all of us, if you're a parent, all of us have lost our tempers with our kids at some point. We think, 
man, I really blew it with them. I should have handled this differently. I should have said this to them in a loving way, but I know I lost my temper. I was angry with them, and so I disciplined them out of anger. Uh, I've done that before multiple times. I've had, to, I've had to apologize to my kids, saying, I'm sorry, I disciplined you out of anger instead of love. And you see here that God's disposition toward us in how he disciplines, he never has to apologize for that. He never disciplines us out of anger. He never says, I am going to do this because I'm going to smite you. If you're a Christian, God looks at you and says, I love you. I'm not doing this to hurt you. And these words from Peter, 1 Peter 4. Beloved, so these words, beloved, you are loved. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. We feel that way. We feel like it's strange when these things happen. Peter's saying it's not. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, that those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. The whole point of what Peter is saying here is that if you are a Christian, you're going to suffer. And it's not a strange thing when you do. Don't think it a strange thing when these things come upon you to test you because that is God's purpose, to test you. And as we know from the rest of Scripture we looked at this morning and the previous weeks, if you are not tested, you are an illegitimate child. If you're not tested, you're not going to be shown to be true. You don't want that. You don't get to the end of your life and say, guess what, you were a fraud the whole time. You don't want that. You want the opportunity to show what are you really and to wake up if you're not what you think that you are. But what Peter is saying here is like, look, guys, don't be surprised. Don't think this is a strange thing. Instead, know that your creator is faithful. Your creator is faithful. And you do good and you trust him as you go through this process and understand he's doing this for your good. You're suffering in a way that you can trust God with it. And as you endure suffering as a form of God's discipline, you think, I am not here because God is angry with me. I'm not here because God hates me. I'm not here because God is trying to punish me. I'm here because God is teaching me. And this is something that every Christian person, if you live long enough, will experience. Every Christian person will experience this. And it is a good thing. The picture I want you to think of here, I'll get to it in a second. The Christian is not the sum of his circumstances or a victim of what has happened to him, but the intentionally shaped product of a God who uses circumstances in order to accomplish what he knows to be necessary for us to endure. It's kind of a statement that probably belongs in a book in terms of it just being long and you might have to underline things and try to break it down a little bit more to understand, but I think it's important. And the reason I think it's important is this, because especially with the advent of psychology as a popular discipline, It's easy to look at ourselves not only as products of biology and just think, okay, well, I am my brain. My brain's processes reflect what I am. Okay, so if you have X disorder, Y disorder, that's representative of who you are. Now, there are realities when it comes to psychological um, diagnoses. There are things that exist there, but at the end of the day, that's not who you are. You're not that popular for us to think that we're a diagnosis, popular for us furthermore to think that we are the sum of our circumstances. So if you experience this and you experience that, you experience this, you experience that, it's kind of like you, you, you think of a, uh, a picture of a, of a person that's drawn on paper and, and it's like every, every experience kind of makes up a little bit. You think the United Way fundraising thermometers and it's like a little bit fills up, fills up, fills up. And for us, we think it's it, common that we think it's circumstances that are the, the mercury in that thermometer just kind of fill us up and this is what explains who we are. And you experience this and you experience that and that this is representative of who we are. You experience this while you are this type of person. And yet, what I would argue 
is that for the Christian, what you've experienced is an intentional tool in God's hand to make you who you are. God is not looking at you and saying, well, you did this, and this happened to you, and you did this, and this happened to you, this is how I see you. Instead, he says, I see you as an end product. I see you as my son. I see you as my daughter. I see what I have called you to be and what you will be at the end. When you get to glory, you will be perfect. There will be nothing wrong with you. When you arrive in the presence of God, there will be nothing wrong at all. And it will not be said of you that when you get there that you are the result of experiencing all these different things and this is just who you are. Instead, it will be God used these chisels. He used these hammers. He used these different things in this process of living in a fallen world to make you fit for glory. Everything you don't like that's happened to you is intentional in God's hands. And he's used it as a tool to make you who you need to be. So that when you go to glory, you will give thanks to him for everything that you right now think, I can't stand this about myself. And this is something that we need to preach to ourselves. I need to preach this to myself. You need to preach this to yourself. When you think about things that happened that you just wish were so different, you think, this is not a mistake. It's not an accident. God loves me too much for this to be a mistake. And he's using these things to shape me to be this final product looking like his son. And that's what brings us to this, the end in sight. Hebrews 12, 10 through 11, for they disciplined us for a short time, these earthly fathers, they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So here, when we are tempted to quit, veer off the narrow path, we need to remind ourselves and each other, not just for yourself, you remind each other of this, you remind each other of the good that's being produced now and the glory that will be magnified later. Peter says this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. I think this is absolutely perfect and fitting for how we think about this, how we preach to ourselves, preach to each other about this. He says this, Peter does to these believers. He says that God's divine power has granted to us, believers, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Now, this is what we see in Hebrews 12. It says that you may share in his holiness. Peter says it this way. He says that you may become partakers of the divine nature. That seems like a pretty big deal. You, a sinful human being, you, a fallen human being, you, the person who lets out words you wish you didn't let out, who's angry at your spouse at times, who goes to bed upset at your parents, whatever, you fill in the blank of what you do that's wrong. And God says in his word that you, sinful, imperfect human being, have become a partaker of the divine nature. God's disciplining you so that you might share in that. Continuing so that through them, these promises of God, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, now see if you hear discipline, this self-imposed discipline, God, God communicating to us, you, you take this seriously, you work with me in this process. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you want a rich welcome, you want a happy welcome into the kingdom of God when you go and this body expires, 
then live like one who says, not I hate discipline, I hate reproof, I hate being called out for what needs to change in me. So let's say, what a blessing that God would call me to change. What's this God that I will, I will receive this eternally glorious welcome? I'll receive this from you if, if I simply apply myself to be part of this process you called me to, which is to change, to grow, to be different, to be made like your son, and, and, and I can cooperate with you in that process? And that's going to result in this? If somebody told you today, and maybe you've heard these these different stories about like, if you put away a penny today and two pennies tomorrow and three pennies the day after, you're going to retire a millionaire, right? I mean, you've heard these things if you do this, and that's just an exercise in discipline. You teach yourself day after day, just do a little bit more and a little bit more, and, and you get to a point where you're putting away huge chunks of cash, and you see this reward, you see this goal that's going to be accomplished if you simply participate in this disciplinary process. So what is it about the goal that God has set before us that we don't care about, we don't like, we don't get? When we look at God's restraining fatherly care, his disciplinary hand and say, God, I don't like this because I really think your love for me looks like this. I'll, I'll be okay being self-controlled and disciplined if that means I'm going to retire as a millionaire. But if I have to accept the fact that your hands, experiences that I don't like are being worked out toward me, I don't think I can handle that. And the whole point of what this author is saying, he's saying, have you forgotten the exhortation that calls you out of sons? Have you forgotten that? Because if you have, wake up and be reminded there is glory on the other end of this process of discipline. God is not inflicting punishment on you. He's not inflicting pain on purpose. He's using these as tools to shape you for a glorious inheritance. Psalm 94, blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law to give him rest from days of trouble until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage for justice will return to the righteous and all the upright in heart will follow it. It's going to be a day where everything evil, everything awful is going to be put away. God is not going to forsake you. Trust him. Rest in him. Endure. Do what is good and right and true and God will reward you. Don't kick your feet at God. Don't make him drag you to heaven kicking and screaming. Be thankful you have a father who loves you enough to discipline you and care for you. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I'll leave you with these words before I go to communion. These are words Jesus spoke to a church. We know some of them, they're familiar with us, but there's something I want you to kind of pay attention to when it talks about discipline. When we think about how would God speak to our church family, how would God speak to us individually, and think it's not wrong to identify things that need to change. It's not wrong to endure hardship. It's not wrong to do these because God is caring for us. It's Jesus literally writing a letter to a church through John. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, I've prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Now listen to this. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. We hear these words. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We just think evangelism. 
It's not, it's not what's being spoken of here. This is not an evangelistic verse. This is a verse written to Christians saying, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. And what is the call then? It says, be zealous and repent. Change how you think about this stuff. Don't, don't make God come and drag you out of this situation. Be zealous. Rethink what's bringing you into this place. And then hear Jesus' voice. And like it says here, stand at the door and knock. You hear my voice, I'm going to come in and eat with you. Listen, listen for me. And this is going to be the end result of discipline. Experiencing fellowship with God now and in eternity. Sitting on the throne of Christ himself. If that doesn't sound like a good enough incentive for you to say, God, I'm going to trust you in my discipline through circumstance and suffering, then you need a radical reorientation of what matters to you. Let's pray. Father, we desperately need to be reminded of this. And this week, we're going we're to see things we don't like things we don't want to experience. And we need you by your Holy Spirit directly and through each other to, to remind us those whom you love, you approve and discipline. This is just plain and simple truth, Lord. We don't want to forget it. You love us so much that you won't let us go off on our own. And we pray, Father, now, people we know who have gone off on their own Pray in our hearts, Lord, knowing of names and faces that we can picture. And say, Lord, please don't let them keep on their own. Please don't let them keep on their own. Because those whom you love, you are proven discipline. You'll never let us be happy in our sin for any extended period of time. You'll never let us go off on our own and have things our own way. As though that were some, uh, some mark, some sign of your favor. Instead, it's a sign of judgment. We don't want to be judged by that. We want to be judged by you as faithful. And so as we come to this time of communion, Lord, I pray that you would please find us faithful to you and how we assess ourselves in sober-mindedness. And we would have a special time of communing with you over your word, knowing that you love us so dearly. Um, you give us boundaries. Thank you for this time over your word. Please bless its effectiveness throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen.